just slow down. So the next most important part of our blog post is going to be imagery. Imagery really dials people in, helps them stop scanning, and also helps them break up the text. So you can do that by adding it to the media folder here, or you can just search for your image. Um, a cool tidbit here is um, you can't go ahead and pull any image off of Google. Well, you could, but you might get um, flagged for it and asked to take it down off your website. Um, a little story that I like to share is one time my sister, who works for a consignment furniture store, um, took a picture of a picture that had some copyrighted content in it and posted it on their website, and they were asked to take that picture down. So. People can find this stuff. I'm not saying that they will find it, but it's better if you err on the side of caution. So when you are doing a Google image search, you can head over to Tools, Usage Rights, Labeled for Reuse with Modification. So this will usually pull up stuff from um, Wikipedia or um, other Commons um, archives that you're able to download pictures from. It's definitely going to limit the number of pictures that you can get, but um, you can still find what you're looking for. So in this case, we're going to be looking for this picture here. Take a look at the image. We're going to save the image to our desktop. Perfect. And then we're going to add it in to our blog post. So you can either go into upload files here and go through your browser and find it. So let's say we wanted to do that. We can go in and select the file. God, this one's a mess. That's right. And upload it, or you could just drag and drop it from here. So now that we have the image uploaded, we want to look at a couple things. Um, the main thing that we're going to look at is the size. This is actually a good size, so it's actually not a good example of what I wanted to show. So um, we do have um, software plugged onto your site that will eliminate the size issue. Usually, if you upload an image that's larger than 920 pixels by 920 pixels, it's going to crop it down to be 920 pixels by its other dimension. This will typically allow you to keep the file size fairly low. Um, we definitely recommend keeping it under 300 kilobytes. Uh, under 300 kilobytes is good, under 500 kilobytes is okay, and anything over one megabyte is really going to slow your load page down. Mm -hmm. So once you've got that settled, then you just want to add in the alternative text. So alternative text is really important because um, people with screen readers and search engines can't see images on your page, so you have to be able to describe them. <coughs> to the um, search robots and to people with screenwriters. So this would be blog slow load with letters. So you can be negatively impacted um, by Google if you don't have alternative text on your images. Can you repeat that? Um, so if Google goes over your website and sees that there's no alternative text on your images, so you haven't filled out this alt text box, and it can say this person isn't being um, compliant to people with screen readers, or um, this isn't giving me an <coughs> look at what these images are, so we're either not going to factor these into your ranking, or you might even get dinged for it. It won't be a very large ding, but um, you can <coughs> So every image you load, you have to fill in an alternative text for it, and that's just a basic description of what the image yeah, is. Yeah, like okay. less than a sentence usually. We usually find like five to ten words is enough for alternative text. And that's not going to show up in the blog, the alternative text? No, it will not. <coughs> Um, so here, you're able to change the alignment and the size of your image. So if you want to head in, you can hit edit. You can pull it through as large, which we typically find is much too large. I find that the sweet spot for images in your blogs 
you can go to custom size and the count is 600 by around 400. So then if we update that, and then we align it right so that text wraps around it, we're able to preview this. And this blog's really starting to come along. So now um, you can do a number of other things. Um, in certain fields, you might want to be uploading PDFs to your website. So in that circumstance, you're able to um, head into your media library. Find any. on any PDF, and you're able to click into it. And then this is a bit of a nuancing thing. This, this is the way that I find is best to add PDFs. So you're going to click on the URL box so that it's selected. You can see the blue box around it. And then you're going to hit Control A on PCs or Command A on Macs. You can try to select this, but I find that it's very touch and go. So if you click the blue box, hit Control A to select everything, then copy it. Whoops. You can head back to your post, highlight the text that you want to link to that PDF, and then you can either hit um, the link button up there and paste it in, or you can just highlight the text that you want to add the link to and paste it on top of it, and it will automatically become a link. Now, if we go over to preview that, we can see that the text down here has been turned into a link for our PDF. So you can go ahead and open that up, and it links straight to the PDF. So the PDF lives on the server? Yeah. But it also doesn't affect page load. Um, so essentially, um, page load will only be affected by the things that are loading with the page. And we can see here that would take into account the image and this text, and it says, hey, there is a link here, but this link goes somewhere else. Um, we usually find that PDFs are larger than one megabyte, so um, it's really nice that you have to click on the link to be able to open it up. But do we get credit for that then through Google? Like, does Google give us credit for the PDF? Um, yes and no. Okay. So it will say that this PDF belongs to this person, and I have seen it a couple times that PDFs are actually ranking for stuff. Mm -hmm. but we find that typically, if you want something to rank, then take it out of the PDF and put it into a blog post. Okay. Are you, uh, are you limited to your capacity for blog posts? So let's say for regular purposes, I just like hand show and did five blogs a day with PDFs and everything attached to it. At what point in time does it start to slow down in response to the website? So like, you can take you can take a look at like I don't know really. Um, I follow a lot of like cooking blogs or like search engine optimization blogs. They're such big organizations that they're pushing out blogs all day about a whole bunch of different subjects and it really helps them. Um, that said, it might not help you if you haven't optimized your content strategy so you're not posting about what people are trying to find um, and you're not creating quality content. If you're just putting out a blog post with a sentence on it, it's not going to rank. We find that like... I guess my question is more revolved around the capacity of the server to keep up with as many. Oh yes, no. C capacity of the server will definitely handle it. Awesome. But um, to finish my point, um, we find that a minimum of 300 words for a blog if you want it to actually rank. And like, if you really, really want it to rank, I would go like at least a thousand words. Even though people don't read anymore. People don't read anymore, but search engines love it. Okay. And it all, um, lots of search engine factors. They're starting to take a lot more into account um, the user experience of the page, so how long people are spending on the page, how many times they're clicking, um, the bounce rate, that kind of stuff. Um, so then if we want to go through and find a video to add to our blog post, then you would go over to YouTube, you would find the blog post that you would like to post, or sorry, the video you would like to post. In our circumstance, we will be looking for. Um, I was hoping to find an eye in the car. Just 
post this. <coughs> so um, there's a couple different ways you can go about adding a YouTube video. You can just go ahead and copy the link and then paste it in here. And then it will automatically generate the thumbnail and pull in the iframe for you, um, which is super nice. See here, if you want to customize this a little bit more, then you can go into share, embed, and then you start getting into um, options. If you don't want suggested videos to play at the end of the video, you would uncheck that. If you don't want the player controls to be there, then you would uncheck that. We usually leave these two checked and uncheck this one. And you can also um, toy with the width and the height of the blog post at that point. Um, the only caveat is that if you put it into the text editor here, it doesn't read HTML, so it'll just come out like that. Whereas if you go over to, sorry, the visual editor, if you add it into the text editor here, then that is where you will start to be able to play around with the HTML of your site. So if you're putting like anything in here and it doesn't seem to be showing up properly, I would refer to this end. And this is where it starts to get a bit more tricky. So if you need any help with that, let us know. Is that possible to do with your pages as well? Like in that YouTube videos? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. All right. I don't know if you had said it before, but um, when you're changing sizes of videos and photos, does that optimize already for mobile? Um, yeah, so all of our themes are mobile responsive, so that means it will tailor itself to mobile. Like, you're not going to have a situation where your image is going way off the page. Um, you're not going to have a situation where your video is going way off the page. Um, but um, sizes and display are one thing that I would really, really make sure that you're um, taking into account when you're posting an image or video to your blog. If you're posting an image that has a lot of text on it, which we don't recommend, we recommend always having the text on the page and having image be an image. But if you have an image with a lot of text, that's going to shrink down on a mobile phone, so it's going to be a lot harder to read. Mm -hmm. Or if the um, image is really large, then it will definitely slow down the mobile phone because they don't have as much processing power as computers, and they can often be on a lot worse networks. What size did you say for video? Um, so, uh, like, I really like the size 600 by 400. For, oh, for images and videos? Yeah. For both yeah. Um, so now that our blog is looking good, we're like, you know what, this is a lot of good information. We have added our headers, we've added our images, we've added our lists, we've added our links. Um, we're going, the last check we're going to make is to make sure that there is a call to action on the website or on the blog. Um, we always suggest um, adding in something at the end of the blog and sometimes even in the middle of the blog. It's a conversion driven blog. Um, so that when people are reading, they don't end the article and they say, so what? Like, awesome, that was a great post about how to write a WordPress blog, but what do I do now? You can say, go out and write your own blog posts, or if you need more help, contact us, or for more lessons on how to do WordPress related stuff, click here. Um, but just give them something to do at the end of the website so they're not left saying, so what? And now that we've included our call to action, which we'll right here. Um, we're going to go through my patented reverse C <coughs> publishing check. Sorry, the call to action should just be regular font. It doesn't need to be a heading size. Um, I wouldn't recommend it being a heading size, but you can do things to help it stand out. Like you can um, put in a button, or you can use a link. I would usually su usually suggest at the very least, like if you're linking to a contact page, or in this case. We'll look back to our home page. And you can make 
the text a link. Um, we do recommend making it stand out a little bit. Um, the trouble here is that um, I wouldn't, I guess making it a heading two wouldn't necessarily be like, it, it wouldn't be a negative impact on search engine optimization. It's just that there's no content that relates to that heading. So like in terms of like the hierarchical nature of it, it doesn't exactly make sense. Um, another thing that you could do if you're comfortable with HTML is actually go in and make it look different. Um, but in terms of actually just like changing the font size, there isn't an option for that um, in a blog post, but there is on pages. We usually find... Um, so there is an option to change the color or change the font size on there? There's an option to change the color, um, but not the font size. If you don't see that option, you're able to toggle the toolbar and you can change it to... So if you're not recommending changing font size, like is color one of the ways you would change it then? Yeah. Um, it really depends. We find for blog posts that you don't really want to make it like glaring okay. um, because that might draw a user's eyes before they're done the article. Um, it's more of like an afterthought, like if they've finished the article, give them something to do rather than distract them from the article and have them move on. Just to way, I feel like a lot of blog posts that I read uh, often you either send them back to the original like might be shown or send them to another article that you've written. Mm -hmm. So just to keep the constant flow, keep them on your site. Mm -hmm. I would say probably another thing you can do is if you guys do follow popular blog posts that you that you enjoy, kind of see what they do at the end. If they put them in bold or just to get some tips about what other popular blogs do. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, back to the patented reverse C check. So you're going to see this by going through, starting up here, heading down along the side, and then ending over here. So it forms a reverse C. <laughs> so you're going to start off with your um, blog post title. You're going to want to make sure that this blog post is being portrayed correctly. It has the proper heading in, all that fun stuff. You're going to take a look at the URL, make sure that it's not too long. We recommend uh, four to five words in this slug. Yeah, so we recommend around four to five words in that slug. It can be less, it shouldn't be much more because that starts to get weird with user experience and um, you could be flagged for stuffing keywords. Um, so once you've figured that out. And you can edit that and change what words you want in there? Yes, and I would recommend doing this before posting because if you do it after posting and after the post has been indexed, you could be running into 404 errors where people have gone to the old link but it's no longer there. Yeah, exactly. Nobody likes 404s. <laughs> um, and then you're going to take a look at your publishing widget. Um, you're not ready to go ahead and hit publish now, but if you want to save the draft before you go any further, you can do that. You can also, there's also a really cool scheduling functionality, so you can go into publish immediately and change the date. So you can say, you know what, this post is about something that's only relevant in March. So I'm going to have the blog come out on March 1st at 9.59 a.m. And then you'll see here that the publish button changed to schedule. So the next thing that you're going to want to do is categorize your post. A really cool feature of the <coughs> WordPress is the categorization of these posts so you can have different blogs pulling in on different pages, excuse me, um, or um, so an, an example of this is we usually run careers pages through blog posts. So if you're making a post about a new career opportunity coming up at your place of work, you would go in and say, I'm going to add this category as careers, and then uncheck and categorize. And then when this post gets published out, it will only show up in feeds that are showing careers. Um, and I'll be able to show you how to do that when we get to the pages. Um, so tags here is actually something that we've changed in the last two months. We, we no longer use tags because um, the reason we have stopped is because you usually use keywords in these tags 
these keywords then generate their own archives on your website. So let's say there's a bunch of blogs with a tag that says how to write a best practice WordPress blog post. Um, so this archive will generate all the posts that we've tagged with that and create its own archive, which can end up ranking for that keyword, which we don't want. You want your cornerstone piece of content to be ranking. So I'm gonna draw it up on the... So let's say this is the blog post that we want to be ranking for how to write a blog post. Um, then we're going to have other pages linking back to this that are still related on how to write a blog post. Like this might be like image optimization tips for blogs. Is this called backlinking? Um, backlinking is using external links. This is internal. It's like uh, many pages. Um, this is called cornerstone content. Okay. So this would be the cornerstone content, and then these would be the pages linking back to it that are related to how to write a blog post. So you want this post to be coming out on top, and you're using these posts to feed into it. And that is why the tag category isn't good, because the tag category could be over here, trying to rank for that keyword and actually cannibalizing some of the um, traffic that should be coming to this page, which is why we don't use tags. So we skip tags, we can skip simply, exclude, and now we're going to add our featured image. So the featured image is a um, big part of sharing your blog posts through external means such as social media or um, newsletters or something like that. So this will be the image that shows up with your blog. I don't know if you've ever put a link into Facebook or Twitter, but when you do, it creates this thing that drops down and I'll actually just be able to show you. So we're gonna use that featured image there. Uh, and then I'm just gonna go ahead and and that would obviously like that would be one that's embedded in there. And you, that's just the one that you're selecting to be the one that shows up on Facebook. Yeah, on Facebook and Twitter and so on. So Did you say how many images you recommend in the blog? Um, we usually say one for every 300 words. Okay. It's pretty close to um, the golden standard. So let's say we've gone through, we've written our blog post, and we're ready to share it, which we're not right now, but I'm just doing this for the sake of it. Still distracted. <laughs> yeah, so ignore that BuzzFeed video. So what we can see here, we've put the URL into Facebook, and now um, the featured image has showed up here, along with the title tag, the meta description, which we're about to get to. So we've added our featured image, and then we're going to get into the search engine optimization app aspect of it. So this will allow you to edit the snippet that shows up in search engines. So if we go back to our bananas search, you can see here, this is the title tag of the post, this is the URL, this is... Um, a SERP feature, which doesn't necessarily come across in all blog posts, um, and this is the meta description, which Google finds is most relevant to your query. So if we go through, we can change what's going to show up in the title tag, we can change the URL, but we already did that up top, so we're going to want to leave it, and then we can change what's going to be previewed with your blog post. So here we're going to say how to write uh, best practice WordPress blog. And then um, this is your opportunity to get a little bit fancier than the page title because it's not actually going to show up in your blog post, but it's going to show up for people who are searching, um, who are coming across it in search engines. So if we want to say best practice for um, digital 
marketing, and then you can throw in a little intrigue. I've gone over. So that will um, tell you when you've gone. Like if you're down here, you're at the correct length for a title tag. If you're down here, you're a bit too short. But if you go too long, it will let you know as well that it's probably going to be cut off in the search page. Uh, we usually say go long instead of short though. So if you can't make it the perfect length, it's better to make it a little bit longer than a little bit shorter. Um, and then meta description, so you're going to sum up your blog post in about a sentence and leave a call to action at the end. So this would be um, like from Intrigue Media shows to right. I don't know why it's doing that. It's really weird. Best practice WordPress blog post for digital marketing. So you've included the keywords that you're trying to rank for, how to write how to write a best practice WordPress blog, how to write a best practice WordPress blog, um, and your title tag and meta description, and hopefully in some of your headings and all throughout your copy so that this page is really being primed to rank for that. And that call for action at the end, read more here, mm -hmm. wasn't connected to the length of the call to action later on. That's just sort of a invitation to come read the blog. Yeah, exactly. So th that's going to show up like here so that they know that this blog post continues on more than just that one sentence, essentially. Because otherwise what will be produced is like the bananas one where it just keeps going and it... Yeah, it, it keeps going it and it, it, if you don't create a meta description, Google's going to say, all right, like I'm going to try to pull the most relevant information from your page and that might not always be the most relevant. Um, so then, yeah, we can hit... We're ready to just push that back to a draft. So then we can go over, we've written our content, we've done our reverse C check, and then we can go ahead and publish the blog post. So I'm going to use a very similar illustration. Here. So, um, a good thing to answer your question, Laura and Dave, about um, how to drive traffic to your website. So, we always find that your website is the backbone of your marketing strategy. You want everything you're doing and saying to live on your website because that's where people are going to convert from. That's where people are going to contact you or they're going to learn more or they're going to book a consultation or book a test drive or book a service appointment. So that's where you want to get people back to. So you can have your Facebook here, your Twitter here, your okay. newsletters here. Um, you can go LinkedIn. So you're going to post your posts on your website and then you're going to link them to Facebook and Twitter and your newsletter and LinkedIn. And you're gonna say, hey, we just wrote a cool blog post about this. Come check it out here. They click the button and they're back on your website where they're gonna be able to do all that fun stuff, which is um, converting and the reason that you guys have a website in the first place. Um, a lot of people, uh, if you're just having a small event, a lot of people would push it out separately. They would say, yeah, I'm doing a blog post or I'm doing a Facebook post, I'm doing a Twitter post. I would always recommend posting it on your website. That's where it's supposed to live. And then linking it out to your social media and newsletters. Can I have a question? Yeah. Um, somebody that I follow for her blog postings, they get emailed to me and so I don't have to go I'm not going to the her website to look that. Oh, we just get emailed. So is that is there any usefulness to that? Like, would we want to have followers for blogs that anytime a new blog comes out, it just gets emailed to them so that they know something? Like, does that help in any way? Yeah. So you can see here. 
um, this email subscribers. This is a plugin that we've added to all of our WordPress builds that um, will have a section for people to sign up with their email so that anytime a new post comes out, you get notified. They won't include the entire blog post in that notification so email. That one would just be a like a notice. There's been a yeah, new it'd be blog like, hey, posted, a, a new but not blog. the actual. Yeah, and like. Uh, again, our recommendations would be to like really tailor the content you want. We find that people that are subscribing to like posts coming out are part of your tribe. So these are people who are like, these people are awesome and I want to hear everything they say. Um, there's a lot more um, merit to tailoring the content that you want to go out in newsletters because then you're able to make it look pretty and you're able to um, link people who have signed up for specific things with the content that they've signed up for. So my, my suggestion there would be to uh, tease it out in a newsletter so that they come back to your website. Cool, so any questions about blog posting so far? Sorry, if we wanted to do that email subscription piece, mm -hmm. that you see the link to that from the blog or on the website? Um, so the blog and the website are one and the same. The, the actually, but on the actual like blog part. Oh yeah, well, we, we, you would definitely be able to add that. Like, um, so there's a piece of short code that comes with it that I'll be able to talk more about um, if it's something that you guys want in your website uh, blog template, where you're able to like just have that at the bottom of every single blog page. So right. just like, hey, uh, we usually include it in the footer of the website. So like any page on the website, there's going to be like a newsletter subscription or a blog subscription of some sort. So we talked about there, we talked about how to write blogs, how to properly SEO them for um, search engines who will be crawling your site. We talked about best practice to go about posting your blogs. Now we're going to get into pages. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit about Visual Composer forms and then how to add new pages to your menu. And then we'll open up the questions. Almost there, guys. Last leg. So, if you want to find your pages, so uh, again, just to recap, posts, a lot more recent information. They're used to target long tail keywords. They're going to be about specific topics. They can be dictated by like, recency. They're going to be pulled in dynamically and can be categorized. Pages are going to be a lot more static. They're going to be the cornerstones of your website. They're going to be what, where your services live, where your contact page is, your about page. These pages aren't going to move off of your website. They're not going to change based on the date. These are going to be here to stay. Um, so an example of creating a new page, we'll go through and we'll create an about page for our company. Uh, unless you didn't see that, very similar to adding a new post. You can go in, hit add a new post or page here, add a new page here, or if you're up here, um, you can scroll down here and click add a new page. So, very similar initial um, feel, look and feel to the um, page page as there is to the post page. Um, that's all going to change when we get into the back end editor. So this is the drag and drop editor that I talked about before, which allows you to build beautiful um, web pages without ever needing to write a piece of code, although coding is useful, um, but you won't need to do it on your day to day. So we're going to go here, we're going to write about media. Cool. Um, so there is also a front-end editor where you're able to like, go onto the front-end of the page and drag and drop. Um, we typically don't use it, so this will all be based on the back-end, but everything here can be tied directly to the front-end as well. So um, these back-end Visual Composer um, pages are built of elements. Elements are kind of like Lego pieces. You're able to just stack them together. Um, so you can go here and start with your element. So um, you can add in, you'll always have to start with either a row or a section, sorry. Where did you get to, sorry, where did you get to that page? That that oh, page? sorry, so you can hit here and oh, okay. add right. a new element. Yeah. Um, so I'll show that again. 
Yeah, you can click down here, okay. or you can click here. So we're going to add a new element. So this is a basic row. Um, you're able to um, split it into different columns. So let's say you want one half to be text, then you can split it up here. Choose the half and half, click the add button, throw in your text. And then here you go into the text element um, builder that we saw in um, when trying to build a post. It'll function the exact same way. You can add images to it, although there is a better way to add images, and I'll show you right now. Um, so we're going to hit Save Our Changes, and that's going to make that stick there. So now you go over here, you can add your image. So this will give you a lot more ability to change the image around. Um, you can select it from your media library by clicking there and then by clicking that. But I missed something there. What did I miss? Sizing? The alt text. Ah. Classic. Are you still limited to the size? Um, sorry, the, uh, the size of the image has to be under a bag? Yeah. For this? Same? Yeah. How do you get really high res pictures on your website? That you're playing? We find that 19, 1920 by 1080, well, 1920 pixels is usually going to be good enough if it's 1920 pixels wide. Um, you can see uh, the, most screen sizes are um, smaller than 1920 by 1080. There's a lot that are 1600 pixels. There's a lot that are like 1020. Um, so if you pull up a 1920 pixel image, um, it's usually going to come off crisp and clear, and you don't have to do that much optimizing to it. Awesome. Um, so here you're able to change, uh, change the image size, so you can go super big, or you can go in with, um, I usually find four pages, I like to jump it up from, um, from 600 by 400 to 1000 by 600. You can add a caption to it, you can change the alignment of it, you can do a whole bunch of things. I'm going to be going over this um, fairly high level because the best way to learn this is just to go and build your pages. They look like crap. Go and rebuild them. And there's also a ton of um, a ton of resources online regarding to the Visual Composer. So um, we have two columns here. One's a text block, one's a single image. We can go ahead and preview. So if you don't want to publish your post right away, maybe it's going to be, be staying in the background before um, you actually want to get it live, then you can go ahead and preview it. And then voila, you got two columns, you got a text block, you got an image going. Um, I spoke earlier about adding blogs to your website. I'm just trying to remember the element name. You actually have to go look through them. That's when it gets fun. Ah, the sword is called blog. So here um, you get a lot of different options on the style. Choosing each of these will have it all pull through in a different way. You can choose which one works best for you. We really like Spotlight for um, like our uh, our blog feed, and we really like Modern for our career feed. And seeing that this is the career feed, we're going to stick with Modern. You can play around with the image height. We find that these default settings typically work pretty well. And then this is the most important part. If you're pulling in a specific category, you're going to change this to the blog post that, or the blog category that you want to pull in. A caveat here is if you're trying to pull in a category which no posts are assigned to yet, it won't show up there. So you have to make sure that there is a blog post in that category before you can pull it in. Um, so you can go ahead, save your changes, and preview the site and you can see that your careers page blog is now being pulled in to this about page. Um, can you organize the pages, Mike? So you can put like that about us page in a different header? Like how do you, so like I'm from like a project, for instance, 
since mm -hmm. I'm building a project big firm, I'm saying, and I want it to fall under a certain header. Is that the right terminology? Like at the top, it says like, oh, careers about us mm -hmm. projects. It drops down. There's four links. Oh. Put a new, po uh, a new post mm -hmm. and one of those subcategories. Yeah, so I am going to show you how to edit it's your menu. Yeah, Sorry. it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> WordPress is exciting, I know. I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, so much information. So much information. Um, so uh, another thing, a big, big trend that's really taken over um, web design in general is having big, full width sections up at the top of the page with a little intro introductory text. So a um, way to create that is by using a page section. You can also drag and drop all this stuff and change columns around and do all that fun stuff. But um, in this case, you're going to want to find the background image for your about page. Maybe you upload it from your um, desktop. Maybe it's already there, so you can add that in. Um, something that's really important if you're going to overlay text on top of this is to make sure that. Oh, sorry, I jumped the gun. Excuse me. Um, so you can change which portion the um, section is going to focus on. So um, here we're just going to center center it. We're going to make sure it doesn't repeat or we're going to make sure that it covers the whole background. This will make sure it doesn't tile or anything and it just blows up and looks really nice. Um, there's a whole bunch of different options that I'm going to let you play around with if you're interested in. Um, the overlay color, you can either go um, light if you want to put dark text over top of it, or you could go a bit darker and put light text over top of it. We usually find that if you go um, darker, you have to put less of an overlay on top. You can probably drop it down to two, maybe um, three um, alpha to be able to put over your, um, your text. You can change, um, you can probably ignore this stuff for now, but let's say we want to throw on our text, then we can just duplicate this block, bring it up here, change it, we're going to set our line out, we're going to make it our header one, and then we're going to make the text color white so that it shows up over top. There you have it, now you can add in a bit of empty space. And you got your big, bold images. Um, a lot of people are like, well, how do you get rid of this? This little space annoys everyone. So a um, uh, tip for that is to scroll down and turn on stick template. And at that point, that little space goes away. <laughs> Shh. <laughs> You're welcome, Paul. Have a good one. Um, so at this point, we're going to talk about forms a little bit. So let's say you have your post looking good. Well, actually, I'm going to make it look good really quick. Do we have to use the... Uh the reverse C method before posting pages? Um, there, there's a certain number of things that do apply, but there's a lot that don't. So it's not the reverse C in this case, it's just kind of like an SEO check, okay. um, which I'll be able to take you through as well. So let's say um, we've added in our careers blog down here, and we want to add a form to it. So then we're going to go over to our forms here. And we can see all of the forms that we have under this editor. Excuse me. Um, so in this case, I probably wouldn't edit your default contact page um, form because we configured that to your guys' specific needs. So what I would do is hit duplicate, and then it's just going to create a form for you. You can head into form settings and change the title to careers, 
Another big thing that we like to do is to change the call to action, so the button that's going to show up to submit it. So this would be apply now because people want to know what they're clicking. They're not clicking to get in touch, they're clicking so that they can apply for the job. So to change the terminology there, we'll just go ahead and update the web settings. You can then go in and edit your form. So Again, this is a drag and drop editor. You're able to add the fields that you would like, um, anything along the lines of that. Um, this is a default checkbox that we have because we like to integrate uh, MailChimp or other newsletter signups with our forms. But if it doesn't apply, you can just delete it. Um, let's say in this case scenario, you want to add a file upload so that people can upload their resume. You would just go ahead and drop it in. Um, Say I only want PDFs to be able to be uploaded here, and I'm going to make it required. And then you're going to go ahead and update that. So now, this form is alive, but you want to. I, I wouldn't recommend going into changing confirmations. We have these all set up on your Google Analytics to make sure that when people get to the thank you for contacting us form, that there's a little query string on the end so we can track who's submitting which forms. Um, but you might want to change the notifications, so you might want to change what comes in to you when the form is submitted, and you might want to change what goes out to the user once the form is submitted. So you can change by, you can change the admin notification, you can change which email it's going to be sent to, you can change the company name, you can change what you want the email to say. You can say, hey, HR manager, this is another post from our careers page, or you can just leave it as all the fields are getting submitted. Um, this is the opportunity for you to customize your user experience once they get a response from the form. Maybe you don't want to guarantee that it's going to be two days. Maybe you think that it's going to be one day, or maybe you think that you want to get back in the next hour, or maybe it's going to take two weeks. You can tailor that based on um, the form that they have submitted. So on your careers page, um, for our websites, mm -hmm. are each individual posting, like job posting, we have a form or is that a page? Um, so it, it really depends. Um, I know convention on websites I've built, um, you would have uh, each, each posting is a post that then lives on a page okay. and each posting will either have a form or the entire or the hierarchical page will have the form, if that makes any sense. I, I'm totally following. Okay, cool. Perfect. <laughs> page, post, post, page, form. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. A plus. Um, so now that you've created the form, you might need to refresh the page so you can go ahead and hit save draft. Um, Mike, can I um, upload a form to that? No, you'll have to build it. You have to build it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which does it too easy. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so then you can go into here, add one more element, look for a gravity form. So it's called Gravity Forms, which is another one of our awesome plugins. Or you can just type in form and then find gravity forms. And you can select the form you want to display. This will be the careers one. You can save changes. And we'll go ahead and give that a preview. and you've got your form all laid out, all nice and pretty. Awesome. So let's say we're ready to go ahead and publish this page, but wait, we need to do our SEO check. So very similar to a blog post, you want to go into your Yoast SEO widget, um, edit your snippet, and make sure that you have a properly SEO title and meta description so that when your page gets awesome rankings because you've done such an awesome job SEO in the blog post that it will show up properly in search engine results. I'm just going to turn this light off so we can just... Oh, God. <laughs> oh, there are people in here. Crazy. Um, so once that's done, you're going to go ahead and hit the publish button. And then you'll be able to add this to your menu bar. If you hover over it, it's a really a backwards way of doing it. And I don't like where it is. But if you hover over appearance, then click on menus, you can go in and um, look for um, the, the first thing I would check is to make sure that you're editing the proper menu. So it'll say main navigation, if it's the one across the top. You could have different navigations for different um, pages, but typically it's the main menu that you're going to be adding it to. 
So you're going to want to make sure that's been checked, and then you can go ahead and add in whatever ones you want to add. And then if you want a sitemap and thank you for contacting us to show up when you hover over a boat, that's how you would do it. Um, you can even go in and like, if you want to link a post directly to your blog or your main navigation, you can do so like that just by cl clicking on posts, selecting the posts you want to see, add to menu, and then changing the hierarchy of it if you want to keep it under about or if you want it to be its own um, menu item. So if we save that, then we're able to go back and visit our site. And you can see here, you got the drop downs going, and you've got the other blog post. And now you guys are WordPress experts. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> now you guys are going to take my job. Oh my Do you want another job? <laughs> I think you're safe, Mike. <laughs> um, so I know that was a ton of information. Um, does anybody have any questions about? the pages, lastly? I still want to be able to download a form. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so when people submit samples, mm -hmm. I want them to be able to download a form, fill it out, mm -hmm. and submit it to me. Okay, interesting. Well, like, it, it, I guess it really depends on what the form looks like, and if you want people to be able to like, write in it or not. No, it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be that fancy, but they, they need to be able to print it off and even if, yeah, and then they can just email it to me. So mm -hmm. it's really just as simple as okay. having a form that I can get them to download so, yeah, from perfect. the site. So it can be, it's, yeah, yeah, I know, because we went to, to press to be able to have a questionnaire on, on right, as well. Right, right, there's many, yeah, 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 many people need that. So if we go yeah. back to the um, blog post we wrote, there is a PDF at the bottom here. Right. So if you open that PDF, then you can see here that there's a download sure. option. Mm -hmm. So that would probably be my recommendation. Uh, and like, okay. you can make it the call to action on the page, like, Right. Big button. Oh, well, one thing that we did, did miss on editing the page um, that Paula would have loved, so I'm sad that she's gone, is um, you can add in buttons. Um, buttons are the best call to action. Everybody likes clicking buttons, mm -hmm. uh, especially when they're told not to. Um, so you can head in there, choose if you want it to be outlined or w whatever, what have you. You can add in the text and then let's say you want to link it to this PDF. So you can say, um, download our PDF. Then you would go here, download our PDF um, to be extra, extra large. <laughs> you put the PDF URL in the button URL. Um, if it's going to be a PDF, I would suggest opening it, opening it in a new window. If you open it in the same window, um, so like, let's say I've gone from here to, um, this is actually my bad. So if I go from here and then just click on it, then my Google Analytics session has ended because I've gone off the site and into the media library. Mm -hmm. So now if I hit the back button, I'm going to be seen as direct traffic to this page mm -hmm. and it won't accurately reflect, re reflect my session. So I would always suggest opening PDFs in a new tab. Um, so you can open it in a new window, you can change the alignment of it, you can change the width of it. <coughs> and then we'll just hit save our changes there and you can download the PDF, open it in a new tab, and you can go ahead and download it. Can you just explain that to me again? Mm -hmm. You wanted to down you wanted to open it in a new window mm -hmm. because if then if somebody hits back it Yeah, sorry. Just explain it, that to me? Yeah, so um, the way that Google Analytics is able to track a session is there's a little piece of code on every web page mm -hmm. that says this is the ID of the website, so do your magic and track users through that pages is. that have this code on it. Yeah. So when you open up a PDF, um, this is more of a browser thing than a website thing, so it's going to load this page without mm -hmm. that snippet of code. Okay. So you've gone from what, yeah, you've gone from the website to what the Google Analytics code 
sees as offsite. Offsite. Okay. So then it ends your session. Okay. So now I'm on here, and if I click back then it looks like to Google Analytics that I'm a new user who's just going directly to that page, not a user coming back to it. Okay. Yeah. Nuances. The right? goal is to keep them on the page for as long as possible. Yeah. yeah, the goal is to keep them on the page and to accurately reflect what they're doing because somebody could spend five minutes on your site looking at PDFs and doing all that kind of stuff, but if you've set it up improperly, then you'll see three sessions that are a minute each okay. instead of one five. <coughs> And in one session that's five minutes, it's much more valuable to do that. Yeah, the, like you want. It's just to. Sorry. Yeah, yeah no worries. It's just to um, to let you know mm -hmm. how much traffic you're kind of getting to your site. Right. Mm -hmm. So if if the it'll tell you the a false picture of how many people are visiting because they've gone and then they've come back, but mm -hmm. it was one person. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, and a key metric to Google Analytics and search engines is how, how much time users spent on a certain page, right. how many pages they visited of a website, and um, how long it takes them to uh, just like bounce off the page or not use the page. So mm -hmm. those can definitely be um, inaccurate cool. if you set this up improperly. So we've set up our buttons and PDFs. I'm not sure where we were before that, but does anybody have any other questions? <coughs> to organize a new published page in the appearance button, so after it's like ready to go, I'm ready to put my new page in. Mm. I don't want to put it on a, as like a header on my main landing page. I mm. want to drop it into a sub mm -hmm. uh, category. Mm -hmm. It's through the appearance. Yeah, so you would hover over appearance and yep. click on menus. Okay. I, so, I, I caught half of that at the end. I'm like, oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing I needed to know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if I want to change photos that are on my website now. Perfect. So. Um, if you want to change photos on your website now, um, in your case, you could be adding images to your gallery of happy customers. So then you would go in, you would see your image gallery widget, which we have already created for you, so you wouldn't need to do this. But you would go to the page that you want to add the pictures to, you would hit the edit image gallery button, and then you can add in your images here. And just say, okay, I want to add this one, I want to add this one, and I want to add this one. I know they're all, those are all duplicate images. But you just select the ones that you want to use in the media library and then hit add images. Simple as that. Simple as that. But do you have to be sure alt text? Alt text. Okay. Um, alt text for stuff like galleries and, um, like for your instance, it's. Um, but that's still important? Do yes. You? Okay. Uh, com. Let's see. It's important to do, um, but it'll be a lot like instead of saying "woman making finger guns" in some uh, <laughs> in, in kind of black USB, it would probably be "happy customers one" or something like that. It's a lot less um, necessary to add like a descriptive piece of text. So put your first name and the make and while well, you're making while well perfect. That's a lot better because then you're adding in relevant keywords. They don't want their last name, but you know. Their yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Or like even the make and model of the car would be very effective. Okay. Um, any other questions? To take out images that are already currently in pages is the same rigmarole. So you go to edit mm -hmm. and then delete image or edit image. Do I still need to pull it into a gallery or can I just drag and drop it? No, yeah. So, so like, let's say you're like, you know what? I don't want to maintain this gallery anymore. I'm just going to delete it. And then, boom, it's gone. Or you can be like, you know what? I'm going to take this image, remove it, and replace it, and replace it with this image. Or an image that you've uploaded that has all text. Our mm -hmm. website's comprised of like professional shop of like a super HD camera and cell phone pictures. <laughs> 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 really good one. Yeah. We'll all wait till the summertime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, anything else? I'm here all night. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to crush yeah. yeah. Feel like a soaked sponge. Yeah. Uh, and, and we're gonna like I'm gonna take these notes and we're gonna get our website and I'm gonna go okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have forgotten everything. Yeah. Um, I'm very responsible with emails. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Uh, we do run these sessions every two months, so if you need a refresher, like you're more than welcome to come back to these. Or... Scrub off the keyword search. <laughs> I did, but I, I, I will follow up on that. I'm going to hold you accountable. Okay. Yeah. Uh... Nothing may come of it, but we do sometimes... <laughs> Way to manage the expectation. Um, we do sometimes run these sessions um, that we call uh, the marketing tour. Um, and that could definitely be a segment that we put into marketing tour. And I know it's come up in other sessions, so if we run another marketing tour, that will be added to it. Okay. I'm just making a note of that. And I'm also going to send um, a follow-up email that has some resources, some next steps. What do you guys oh, want okay. to do? It'll probably have the recording of this, which is about okay. to stop. See you later, Chelsea, in three, two.